this morning to, to teach, to, to speak. Um, I really want to come to you this morning with a word that I am going to continue, by the way, coming with this word until I feel empty of it. Um, but it's the rise of suns. Because I think that, I don't think, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that in the world today there is a deficiency of suns in the kingdom of God. In fact, there's a deficiency of suns in the earth. Um, and I, when I talk about sons, I'm not talking about a boy born to a man and a woman. I'm talking about a person, a human being, born of God. Born of God. I'm talking about sons who were, came to Christ, received Christ, were changed by Christ, but took upon them, instead of being adopted into Christ, they were adopted into something called, uh, that we're familiar with called religion. And by being adopted into religion, begin to live by the religious rules. Um, instead of being adopted into Christ, received into Christ, changed, transformed into Christ and becoming a son as Christ, a joint heir, um, which then allows us to come into the place where everything we do is based not on the laws we keep but on the faith we have. And I want to talk to you about that because I believe this, and I've said this, and if you want to go back several weeks now, I've, this is, I think, week three or four that I've been teaching this particular series, um, The Rise of Sons, but... If you want to go back on the podcast and listen to those, I would encourage you to do that. And I would also, before I jump into this, encourage you this morning to jump right into the app. If you've not downloaded the Rock of Central Florida app, please do that while you're sitting here this morning. And then click on the Notes tab, and the Notes tab will take you to where we're at today. Uh, some of you brought to my attention that when you go to the, it's Google, it's Android, Android only. But if you have an Android phone and you go to your Google store or whatever they call that on Google or Android store, whatever it is, and you go there, you see two rock apps. Um, pick the most recent one. I don't know why there's two on there. They're trying to catch up with technology, but they're getting there. And, um, but if you, some of you that are operating that are having a hard time selecting the right app. Because we, rev we did a revision on the app, so you're going to see two. Take the most recent one, and um, it will put you on the right one. But download that app. In fact, the easiest way to do it is delete the Rock app on your phone, and then just re-download it. It, will, it should automatically download the correct one. I'm sorry, Android users, that you have to go through all those steps to, to do something that should be as simple as an update overnight while you're sleeping. But... <laughs> Um, but uh, it is what it is. So, but I'm excited today to teach again on the rise of suns, and there's a lot in me. I'm no way going to get through all of it this morning, um, but I do want to jump right in. And, and I got to tell you, uh, I do my very best to keep what I teach. I try to stay within a 45-minute time frame, and I want to tell you why I do that. It's not to cut God off if God is continuing to teach. It's because I want you to be able to hold on to what you hear because we always have next week uh, when we gather again to continue. So that is always my goal. Sometimes I, I succeed and sometimes I don't, but uh, that is my goal. And there was a time in me when I was religious in my mindset many uh, some time ago um, that I thought, well, you just preach until you're through preaching. Well, by the time I was through preaching, people had, even if they were still in the building, had checked out in their mind long before. So they stopped listening. They stopped hearing. They stopped receiving. And, you know, there's a, there's a saying that I've used in here many times. Um, well, let me not say it. I won't use it anymore. And, uh, but I, I want you, I'd rather you stay happy than leave mad. Or leave happy than stay mad. Yeah, I'd rather you leave happy than stay mad because you're sitting there. I've been in those moments where I've been listening to someone talk or teach and they've, rab they've gone on and on and on. The content is fantastic, but my mind couldn't take anymore. And I, was, and I was done. So I check out. You've been there as well as I have. So please understand, I'm not trying to be religious uh, in, in cutting anything off because I, I'm not. What I do know is we have, enough, we have more time together. Yeah. Today's not the last time we're going to meet. Today is not the last time we're going to meet, well, if, as long as you come back again, but I hope that you will. So I'm very, very excited about continuing this word today, and I would encourage you, first of all, especially those of you that are visitors, and today might be your first time, I'm very grateful, very blessed, and honored that you're present with us today. It, it's a risk when you come into a new place. Uh, you don't know what they believe, what they teach. Um, you come in, but I can tell you, I believe you're in the right place today. Um, you have to decide for yourself when, when we're finished. 
when we conclude today. You have to decide for yourself, but my hope is you'll come back. But as I said, there's a lot in me today. And I want to make sure I do the very best that I can to get it all out in clarity. I want to get it to you the same way Holy Spirit gave it to me. And if I'm even partially successful in that, then I promise you, you will leave today freer than when you came. Amen? So I'm going to pray. And I want you to stand with me one more time. Let's do the Catholic thing today. Let's stand about ten times. But I want to pray and I want to do this uh, recognizing that the Word, if we can lay hold of what He put in me to teach today, if we can lay hold of it, we will, we will be changed. We will be changed. And, and I do give you thanks, Father. I'm thankful that every day you're at work in us. I'm thankful that every day you change us in our minds. You renew our minds. You cause our eyes to see differently than we've ever seen before. You cause our ears to hear very differently than we've ever heard before. I'm talking about sons because that's your heart. Your heart is sonship. It's never been your desire, your plan, your purpose to raise up slaves, orphans, or vagabonds. But you take what has been lonely. You take the one who has been outcast. You take the one who has no one else. And you draw them in and make them a part of a family. Brothers, sisters, sons, and daughters. And for that today, we give you glory. We give you praise. And ask that in our time together this morning that you help us to see and recognize who we actually are in you. We're not just church attenders. We're not just Bible readers. We're not just people who pray and talk to God. But we're sons. We're sons and daughters. Made that because of our faith in your son, Jesus Christ transformed in our mind, transformed in our heart, transformed in our lives. So help us today, everyone. I don't know where every person in this room stands today, Father. I don't know where every person watching on the other side of that glass is today. But what I do know is this. Whether they are hard in their hearts or the most tender to receive, whoever they are, no one is beyond your capacity to change them. There's nothing I can do as a man that will add to or take away from anybody in this room outside of this. If I'm obedient to you, I believe your words that you put in me will be words as they changed me that will change the hearer. So let it be today. Let it be today and be glorified in it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Amen. You may be seated. So I want to continue teaching on the rise of sons today and I want to, if there's a sub heading on this, it would be lawless sons. Everybody say lawless sons. Man, that sounds awful, doesn't it? It sounds terrible. Um, I was sharing as we came out here, uh, before we came out, you know, we pray every week in the back before we come out here, we talk, we share what's in our heart, what Holy Spirit's been speaking to us regarding leading this congregation, leading this house. And it's always uh, enlightening to me um, what different ones are hearing throughout the week that Holy Spirit's speaking and saying to them. And how Yahweh always puts it together. And if you hear me say Yahweh, that's the Hebrew name of God. I'm not talking about uh, God other than the one that you're familiar with, possibly. Um, But I'm talking about the living God, Yahweh. It's the Tetragrammaton, and uh, He's the living God. So that's the name He gave Himself. That's the Hebrew name of God. So don't don't be awash because I use that. But... uh I was sharing back there, recently, some months ago, I had shared a story about, uh, that I had read, um, and I can't remember where it was that I read it, some of you will recall, they did back there, but I read a story about people who speed, who text and drive, who do all of these things, and it talked about, the article was, it was the, the conclusion of some research that had been done for years on speeders and on text, people who text and drive and who are reckless in their driving and in their... Uh, just the way that they are. And it was a a pretty lengthy article. I think it's been a... a Matt and I both think it was maybe three or four months ago that I shared it here. You can look back if you'd like to. But basically, the context of the article was this. It was sharing with... uh, sharing the culmination of the research led to this, that... And and again, I don't remember the exact percentage, so I'm not going to throw one out there, but I will say this, it was really high, that the percentage of people who speed and who text and drive are uneducated and not ignorant, I'm just sharing what the article said, but stupid. And they define the difference between ignorant and stupid. Ignorant is really not even, you're just unaware, completely unaware. Stupid is being aware and then ignoring caution. 
as defined in the article. And it said that most people who are speeders and who text and drive, and, and they were using this as a, and I know some of you do that in here, so I'm just telling you what the article says. <laughs> but um, sometimes I like to say things that the article says because then you can't blame me for it. But, um, but it just shared about how people who do this are the, some of the most selfish people in comparison to others, that speeders, text and drivers are by nature selfish. Everything's about them. There are people who will talk about themselves a lot. They will, they will reflect on their successes more than they are interested in celebrating other people's successes, things like this. And they broke this thing down into so many categories, it was revealing as I began to look at that. And, and it, again, focused on the whole idea that selfish people do not have any caution regarding others. So they don't mind speeding on a highway because... In their mind, it's selfish. I want to get from here to there because I enjoy speeding. They ignore caution, which says, by doing that, I'm putting other people's lives at danger. They ignore caution. By texting and driving, it's about, well, I have to answer this. This is really important. All the while, ignoring that there's an infant in a car seat right beside them that they could endanger. They ignore caution. So it's speeders and texters by nature are selfish people. So my encouragement to you would be this. If you're a speeder or a texter based on that article, and I'm getting somewhere with this, my encouragement would be uh, begin to do things differently. Change your dynamic um, because that is a, it is proven um, that those who do these things are less intelligent than those who don't. So if you want to be known as an intelligent person, Fill in the blank. I say all that because as I was driving here this morning, I was thinking about this subject matter that Holy Spirit has put in my heart for these weeks and, and just considering the idea of being a, a lawless son and what that means. And what the church has done over time is they have, we have created a system uh, there's no way I'm getting through all this today. But we have created a system, a belief, a culture within the church that believes that our existence in Christ, our success in Him, our relationship with Him is determined by the laws that we keep that have been given to us by the preachers or whoever it might be, the denomination or the religion or the non-denomination, whatever it is we follow. But our faith, our relationship with Christ is, it rises or falls based on the laws I keep or don't keep. And the church world by and large has come into this conclusion that if I keep these laws, then somehow my relationship is better with Christ. So I said to the team this morning as I was driving in here, and I'm thinking about this, and I'm thinking about that article about speeding and texting, and all these things, different things were coming through my mind, and... And I immediately also thought about this. I thought about how when someone gets saved, think about this with me for a second. And maybe you even have found yourself in this situation. I did. But think about this. When, you, when someone gets saved, when someone comes to Christ, let's say, for example, I give an altar call. I give an appeal. If anybody's here that needs to receive Jesus Christ, I would like for you to come, and they come. And they stand, and I pray with them, and they received Christ. First of all, people don't receive Christ because I pray with them. They receive Christ because they repent. We need to be clear about that. Is that okay? But just for the sake of story. So I pray with them. They receive Christ. Immediately, the whole church rejoices. Right? Everybody's like, Woo! Hallelujah! We, lay, we throw up our hands, and we celebrate because someone has come to Christ. Then what happens? Immediately following that person coming to Christ, way too many times, more times than not, the first thing that the church does is now immediately begin to judge them for where they're coming up short. Five seconds before, they just came to Christ. Their whole life has been changed. Oh, you sinner, I saw where you were last night. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? You recall, I've told this story many times, the night that I got saved, I was standing, sitting in that choir room in the back of that church, inside the side of that church, and I'm in the choir room, I get saved, and everything's, I mean, everything in me, I was flooded with this sense of, 
I'm changed. I didn't know how to define all that I felt. I didn't know how to, I couldn't, I couldn't, I would not have been able to verbalize that to you except for to say, I knew I was changed. I received Christ sitting at that empty room with that youth pastor in 1985 and I knew that I was changed at that moment. A miracle took place in my life and I felt completely free. Within a few minutes, first of all, the youth pastor's like, yes, you know, celebrating, that's it. You are now a child of God. How do you feel? I feel free. Okay, here's the rules. You heard me tell the story. And I was given a sheet of paper that I was asked to sign that said, you will now not do this and this and this. I'm not going to go into all the details again. But I, I didn't sign it. But I was asked to sign. Sign this. You will not do this and this. Moments before, you are free. You are free. Now do this so you can stay free. Wait a minute. It looks to me like you're sending me into deeper bondage. I was freer before I received Christ and even knew that I had those rules to go by. Is anybody hearing what I'm talking about today? Some of you, many of you, have lived through exactly uh, what I'm talking about today. So when I consider this uh, being lawless sons and what have you, the, the, the challenge with the church today, and Sam reminded me this morning a few years ago when I taught on lawless living, this message on lawless living, the believer was not meant to live a law-filled life. We needed law for a season until we came to who? Until we came to who? Say it louder, Chino. Until we came to Christ. And then when we came to... We're going to read it in Galatians 3. But then when we come to Christ, it shouldn't be law that determines where I am with God. Now it is... Something completely different. It is my faith in Christ. Now I am aware that I have been redeemed and changed. There, were, there was a time, not too many years ago at all, in fact, where if someone came into this church and they were homosexual, I would quickly let them know, we're praying for you, but I would not make a place for them here. Can I be honest? Well, I'm going to be. Where if two people walked in the back doors that were living together but not married, I would quickly, once I became aware of that, make sure I begin to draw lines. Remind them, oh, well, I'm going to tell you what, you don't know Christ yet because if you knew Christ, you wouldn't be doing that. Everybody in this room knows Christ and it's amazing the things you'll do today. I'm glad for the day when Holy Spirit began to convict me, began to change me, began to show me. Amen. It isn't about what people are doing and aren't doing. It doesn't make it right. Because you say, come in, those who are clothed and those who are naked, those who are hungry, those who are filled, those who are thirsty, those who are not, those who are queer, those who are not, those who are whatever. Yes. Fornicating and those who are not, come in. Bring your lawless, your law selves, your mind, your lawless according to Caesar ways in here so that you can become lawless in Christ as He begins to transform you. Is anybody hearing me? So I'm glad for the day that Holy Spirit rebuked me and said, Stop making people feel like they have to fit a mold before they can walk in the doors. Stop making people believe that they have to be perfect before they can come in this doors because, Steve, even you're not perfect. Did somebody just thank God that I'm not perfect? <laughs> That's all good. I didn't realize my imperfections were so visible. I just... Yeah, Jimmy said, I have an iPhone. That's one of them. <laughs> but how many people come to Christ and then immediately begin to keep laws in order to sustain the relationship with Him? Man, what happens when keeping our relationship with Christ is not based on the laws that we keep, but on the faith we possess? Lord. 
But here lies the problem because the church has this issue. The church, one of the, the, the weakness, and I think I said this a couple of weeks ago, but the weakness with the church, one of the weaknesses with the church is that we, are, we expect all the time of others what we do not live up to ourselves. What happens? I wonder, just, just let's do this imaginary moment. What happens when we look across the room and instead of looking at somebody and saying, I know where you were last night, I know what you did last week, I know what your conversation was on Facebook, I know what you put on social media, and I know where you were. Instead of looking at somebody that is doing their very best to live for Christ and have faith in Him, instead of looking at them and immediately beginning to judge them by the laws they're not keeping that we think they should keep, we begin to say, I'm thankful for the one ounce of Christ in them that still has the ability to deal with the 15 ounces of sin in them. Are you hearing me today? Does that mean that we just accept whatever it is? It's not up to me. And it isn't up to you. I want to give you a little history lesson here real quick, just really briefly. How many are familiar with the Puritan church, with the Puritans? You're familiar with you. You will when I tell you about this. So basically, somewhere around the 1500s, this has always been fascinating to me. The whole I've, t- I've referenced it before, but but every faith that there is today, whether you're Pentecostal, you're Baptist, you're Methodist, you're Presbyterian, you're Nazarene, whatever it is, everything basically the Puritan movement was the root of those movements. Uh, whatever that is, that was the catalyst for all of this change. Um, So really what happened, the Puritans came out of the Catholic Church because Catholicism was rooted in its um, emphasis on church government, uh, how government was uh, demonstrated in the church so that there was this order, this pristine order. But there was not an emphasis on law. So their belief was if we can get our government in order in the church, Law will take care of itself. The Puritans looked at Scripture and they, were, they believed that law was more important. If you get law right, government will follow. Proper order will follow if you get law right. So long story short, around 1530, Puritan, this group of people left the Catholic Church. They formed this group. They began to grow and build and they were called the Puritans. So early 1500s. So then following that, you know the rest of the story as they begin to expand and grow. They're in Europe and England and, and then they come to America. And when they come to America, we got the pilgrims and everything else that begin to come from that Puritan movement. And what happened is in that Puritan movement, they begin to they put so much emphasis on the law in order to know Christ that it proliferated. So every denomination, every group, every body of believers that branched off from the... I'm really dumbing this down, but on purpose. But every branch that came out of that movement, that initial movement, every single branch had that same root, and the focus was, if we can keep the law, we can know Christ. In fact, I want you to say this with me. Say, if I can keep... Their belief was, if I can keep the law, I can know Christ. Here's the sad thing. This began in the 1500s, and it's still present now. In fact, it didn't begin in the 1500s. It began actually before Christ. But but the emphasis on today, on our current time, that was the root. So there's a sense, even in the church world, even among some sitting under the sound of my voice right now, there's a mentality in your mind. Right now you're trying to justify which laws are really of Him and which laws aren't, even as I speak. You're right now thinking, well, you know what, this, that's a law. I, I'm not breaking that law. I'm not breaking that law. I'm not. But everything is law-based. Everything about the relationship is law-based. And what the Father is looking for are sons that will rise up with a lawless mentality and put all of their confidence in faith in Him. See, if I live my life with a law consciousness, if everything about me, And my relationship with Jesus Christ is based on law. Nobody sees how many laws I break more than me. And therefore, for every moment of repentance, there's this knowing, but I'm going to break another law. I'm going to lose my cool. I'm going to say something I wish I didn't say. I'm going to throw my fist up at that guy driving beside me that's texting and driving. 
whatever. You fill in the blank. But they broke away from the Catholic Church and they did this because the law was more important than relationship. And, and they became the Puritan church, the modern church even, has become a law unto itself. The spirit of abiding by the law has not changed. The laws have changed. You know, where the Puritans, you would have never been preaching in cowboy boots and blue jeans and a button-down shirt. I'd have had a tie on and had all my, my collar, my hat, the right one. I'd have had everything in place. The laws are still present, they're just different. But that spirit of knowing Him by the law still exists. So, every single day, this law mentality, that, let me say this, and I'm going to demonstrate it in Scripture. But every single day, this law mentality is perpetuated within our church, every church, all around the world, every single day, within believers. So, when I, when I think back, I'm going to read in Galatians 3 in a minute, so turn with me to Galatians 3 while I'm saying, telling you this. When I think back on the day that I received Christ, when I received Christ, if someone had come to me before I prayed and handed me that piece of paper that they wanted me to sign, if they had said to me, Steve, sign this, and then we're going to pray and you can receive Christ. But you've got to do this in order to do that because it would be, it's just the same. There's no difference. I would have said, I'm out. I'm out. Because it wasn't your sheet of paper that moved my spirit when I was listening to that preacher preach today. But it was something way beyond that piece of paper and that ink. I might not be able to identify it right now, but I'm going to tell you it was a deeper authority, a higher authority than that piece of paper. And I would have never come to Christ if somebody came to me and given me the law first and then gave me Christ. There's a reason. The church is shrewd, man. We're going to get you to Christ and then we're going to give you the law. Because if we give you the law first, you'll never come to Christ. And when I say that, you know exactly, you know that I'm telling you the truth because there's people out there right now that will not go to the church because they see the law before they see Christ. Did you hear what I just said? There's people all out there. You have them in your family and you have them in your neighborhood and you have them on your job. And you've asked them, will you come to church with me Sunday? Absolutely not. Why not? Well, I just don't do that. You know why? Because they see the law before they see Christ. The law has blinded them from the relationship. They say, I'm not interested in your laws. If i got to know Him that way, I'm not coming. You came. It's a miracle. It's a miracle that you are saved today. It's a miracle that I'm saved today. It's a miracle that we have been able to overcome the laws that have been applied to us over and over and over again. It's a miracle we've been been able to overcome the laws we apply to others. In fact, too often, we don't. We hold them accountable. You did what? While we did the same thing two weeks before. I mean, that law gets in the way. There's pe- again, I'm going to tell you, there's people stand, they're in their homes right now. They're walking down that road. They're walking their dogs. They're doing whatever it is they're doing today because the law, they cannot see faith. They cannot see the Christ because of the law we've put in front of them. And they'll have nothing to do with it. So let's read in Galatians 3, uh, beginning with verse... Let's start... Uh, Well, let's do verses 1 through 3 first. Paul said, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. This is crazy. I'm literally seeing Him, witnessing Him, and then somehow coming to the place where now it is law that connects me to God, not the one that I watched be crucified and have known to be resurrected. Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit of God by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Let me ask you this, Galatians. Those of you who are in every sense of the word... uh, 
trying to apply legalism to everything that you do. Did you receive the Spirit of God by the works of the law or did you receive the Spirit of God by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? It's exactly what I was talking about when I was in that choir room. Now that you've come to Christ, sign this. Having begun by the Spirit, am I now going to be perfected by the rules that you lay on me? How one arrives at their relationship with Christ determines the foundation of that relationship going forward. If you came to Christ by law, if you came to Christ because, let me say it this way, there are people that have a relationship with Jesus Christ today because they recognized how many laws they were breaking. Everything I do is wrong. And I'm going to come to Christ because everything I do is wrong. So they come to Christ because they know how many laws that they're breaking and they come to Christ and I'm thankful that they came to Christ. But they came to Christ because they recognized the laws that they were breaking. But once you come to Christ because to be free of law, to be free of legalism, then you have to substantiate and prop up that relationship by not breaking laws. It can only be justified through the keeping of the laws. Did that make sense what I just said? And it's true of so many of us. In fact, it doesn't matter. I would count myself as a man who in every... My passion is to know God. My passion is to be a lawless son. I want to celebrate lawlessness. Not that celebrating lawlessness in the sense of breaking rules, but celebrating lawlessness in the sense that I don't need laws to know Christ. See what I'm saying? So I want to count myself as a lawless son. I want to be able to say, you know what? I'm passionate after you and I'm doing all these. And yet in the middle of all of that, I still recognize that there's laws in my life that I put on myself. You need to hear me today. There's a pathway to sonship in him, but I can tell you outside of sonship, you might exist in him, but man, there's nothing like existing in him as a son. Because sons have an authority that others don't, orphans don't, slaves don't. So he said, did you receive the Spirit by law or did you receive the Spirit by faith? So when you came to Christ, did you come to Christ by faith? When you came, did you come because you knew that He was going to change you? Let me ask this question and and you can give me a show of hands and and if you don't remember, that's okay. Um, I'm... My assumption would be that you would remember. But how many of you, when you came to Christ and you received Jesus Christ, it happened at a moment when there was something that compelled you inside and you knew there's no other option for me? How many of you came to Him like that? That's how I came to Him. You knew there was no other option. Something, even if you didn't understand it, I've got to come to Him. How many of you came to Christ because you felt like, and be honest, you felt like you were breaking a lot of rules and you were letting a lot of people down and you, weren't, you couldn't do anything right so you, you knew I've got to come to Christ because I need Him to clean my life up. Raise your hand if that's you. Yeah. And when you look at this, And you consider why any of us have come to Christ? When any of us, when you consider why did I come to Him? Did I come to Him through the flesh or did I come to Him by the Spirit? If I came to Him by the flesh, if I came to Him because of a a law mentality, then I'm going to have to prop that thing up for the rest of my life in a law mentality. But if I come to Him by faith, even when people present laws to me, I'm going to recognize that. See, a slave only knows law. They know what to do, what not to do. If they don't do it, they're condemned. If they do it, they're great. But a son doesn't recognize law. A son recognizes relationship. And even in my wrongdoing, I'm still loved. Slaves know no love. They don't know what it is to be loved. They don't know what it is to come to the Father and be loved. I have a, this slave relationship. I've, I've let him down. I've disappointed him. I'm just a sinner all over again. But that isn't true. Man, I can't get into all that again right now. If I come to Him by law, then law is your foundation. If you come to Him by law, law will be your foundation. If you come to Him by faith, faith faith will be your foundation. And there's a big difference. So no one, everybody say this with me, say no one. No one one is justified by the law. 
Say it. No one is justified by the law. What? You mean if I keep all the laws that the church has given me? If I keep every law, that doesn't make me holy? I wonder how many do that every day. I'm just trying to keep the law, man. They might not even call it law. I'm just trying to live by the Word. And they've made the Word law. Let's read in verse 10, Galatians 3, verse 10 through 14. For all who rely, again, no one is justified by the law. I need, need you to see this. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. I, I mean, I could stop right there. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. What that means is all who depend on keeping the law to know Christ are cursed because they're never going to keep the rules. Same thing he said about the Israelites when they went to Mount Sinai. He said, I'm giving you all these rules. You could never keep them. I knew you weren't going to be able to keep them. But I had to prove to you you couldn't keep them. Because you kept coming to me through these rules and regulations and laws. And I wanted you to understand you could not know me through those things. And those very laws cursed you to the point you couldn't even come into the temple. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. It's interesting. Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now, in verse 11, it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law. For... The righteous, say this with me, the righteous, the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them, the law, will have to live by them. Then verse 13, I just love, I just got, you just got to love it. Christ redeemed, let's make it personal, say this with me, Christ, Christ. redeemed me, redeemed me. say it again, Christ redeemed, me. Christ redeemed me, that's all you have to say, from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. He recognized it is futile for you to try to keep all of these rules and regulations. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take them all upon myself and I'm going to crucify them. They're going to be crucified with me. And what comes out of that grave will be me, but not the law. Redemptive power will come out of the tomb, but not the law. The one who does them will live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised Spirit through faith. The law has never saved anyone. Let me say to you in here this morning, and I hope you will hear this with a good and honest heart. But there's people in this room right now that the law, your relationship with Christ today, your relationship with the Father today, is entirely based on whether or not you keep laws. Every day, you remind yourself of what you've kept, and you remind yourself of what you broke. Every time something comes up and you miss the mark, you feel shame and embarrassment. You feel, con you feel not con what you... The Holy Spirit will convict you, but what you feel is this self-centered thought that somehow I could keep these things and by doing these things I could know Him. And all the while He's saying, where's your faith? Do you think that when I went to the cross, Kimberly, do you think that when I went to the cross that I thought for a second I would go to the cross and you only had one chance? for me to do a miracle in your life. And if you missed it after that one chance, you never had another opportunity? Do you think I wasn't aware that when I went to the cross, 
died on that cross, came out of that tomb, do you think I wasn't aware that you were going to need me? Not just on the day you received me, but the day after and the day after. And do you think that when I came out of that tomb, looking into the future and seeing your face and knowing your name and having hope for you, do you think that when I came out of that tomb, I was immediately going to all the laws you were going to break? what I did when I came out of that tomb here's where my thoughts were those who come to me by faith I will not hold them accountable to the laws they break but I will celebrate with them in the faith they possess those who come to me as slaves I will in every way look to redeem those who come to me in faith in every way I will make them sons Nobody in this room who is a believer today stood before any preacher, knelt at any bedside or at any altar and said, today I receive this law. I repent of my sins to this law. And yet, in too many ways, it seems that is the case. Because our mindset has been pointed towards believing that keeping the law keeps me in right relationship with Him. But the law has not done anything for you, has never saved a single person, but instead became a curse to those who want to know Him. Because we lose sight of, in fact, let me just say this before I move to the next part. In fact, too many of us are so law conscious that we don't even consider the ways we are actually honoring Christ. Our focus is on where we, where we miss it. Not on where we make it. I realize that in our relationships, in our life, in our moving and in our going, I know that we are in relationship with people and we know people that are constantly reminding us of all the ways that we've come up short. And it's easy for people to do. It's especially easy for people within the church world to do. They remind us where we come up short. What happens if there's a rising up of sons who aren't looking for the faults in everybody. But when someone receives Christ, we are the first to come to them and not tell them all the ways they need to clean it up. But instead focus on how they can know Him deeper. And that doesn't mean if you really want to know Him, you're going to stop doing this. Because what you just did in the name of Jesus is apply to law. Are you hearing me today? He's not after law-abiding citizens. He's after sons that do not require the law to know Him, but they know Him by faith. In verse 23 and 26 in Galatians 3, it says, Now before faith came, we were all held captive under the law. Before, before faith came, we were all held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was at a time our guardian until, one of my favorite words, everybody say until. So then the law was our guardian until... Until means the beginning of one thing, the end of another. That's what that means. Until means something is stopping, something is starting. Everybody say until. So then the law was our guardian 
Then it stopped because Christ came. In order that we might be justified, not by law, but by faith. But now, faith has come, now that faith has come, we are no longer, everybody say, I am no longer, am no longer. under a guardian of law. Man, you got to know what I'm telling you today because there's going to be people that are going to walk out of this room today and you're going to do something and you're going to feel like, man, I just failed again. And all the while, God's not saying that. Christ isn't saying, you failure, you failure, you did it again. What He's saying is, don't you know who you are? You've received me. Do you think I thought for a second you were going to be immediately perfected? You are my work. It is in you I am doing an amazing work, a miraculous work. So then the law was our guardian until he came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, I'm no longer under that guardian of law. For in Christ Jesus, for in Christ Jesus, you have all become sons of God, not through the law. Not through the law. But by faith, in Christ Jesus, you have all become sons by faith. How hard do we strive to know Him? I just want to know Him. You know, and I read this book the other day that said if I would just read for another 30 minutes... Man, I, I want to know him, man. I'm, I'm telling you, if I go to, I, I need to go to more conferences this year because I need to know him deeper. Man, I just want to know God so much. I just, I want to know Jesus Christ. I want a deeper relationship with him. So, man, I, what I need to do is I need to do this and I need to do this. And all of those things are laws. <laughs> They're laws. They're laws. They're laws. And it will curse you because you'll come under the same curse of the conference. The same curse of the expectations that this one and that one and that thing begin to apply to you. See, someone might say, well, I, you know, what you're doing right now is you're promoting. You are promoting for people to just be free and be liberated. <laughs> yeah, but what about sin, man? You're just, you're just, you're just knocking out sin by faith. Yeah, well, you don't understand because it's really hard for me to worship and and lift up my hands and sing because I know about this one over there and this one over there or this one sitting in front of me or this one on the same road that I... And I know all of these things and there's a lot of sin going on in their life. Yeah, there's a lot of faith going on too. Why are you so quick to recognize the sin and so slow to recognize the faith? Is anybody hearing what I'm saying this morning? Oh, but man, you know, they're coming up short. They're never going to know God because they got all these things present. Again, you recognize sin, you don't recognize faith. It's not up to you and me to decide whether or not somebody's received Christ. It's up to them and Christ to decide whether or not they've received Christ. I was so law conscious for so long, even when I thought I wasn't law conscious. I still have a measure of it. I still look at you sometimes and I see some things that y'all do and I'm like, oh my gosh, they're embarrassing. I'm sure I've embarrassed you too. But what he's doing in me, and what he's been doing in me for a long time, is he's beginning to change my perception, my reality, my focus. Isn't on, again, there was a time if you weren't married and you came in here and you're living together, man, I jumped on you like a lion on roadkill, man. I was on you. I couldn't wait to get to you and tell you, you better get that cleaned up. Jesus doesn't like it. <laughs> You're a homosexual? Oh, man, you have put yourself in a whole different kind of hell. Can I be honest? And he began to work in me. Are you helping them? Look out. Steve? Look out. 
Are you giving anybody opportunity to see truth? Are you exposing them to life? Because laws aren't life. Laws are a curse. That's right. Woo. Come on. Why don't you expose them to faith? Wow. What? <laughs> yeah. Show them what faith looks like. Remember when you came? You were a mess. Remember how everybody kept telling you how much of a mess you were? So then the law was our guardian until he came. But now faith has come. We're no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. So let me ask you a question. Do you find holiness in the keeping of laws or in faith in Jesus Christ? Answer yourself. Do you find holiness in the keeping of laws or in faith in Jesus Christ? Where do you find your holiness? You might say, well, I'm not holy. Well, why not? You can be. See, holiness is not measured by perfection. Holiness is measured by how I stand in Him. What is my standing in the Father? I'm holy. And I'm not ashamed to tell you I'm holy. In fact, He tells us in 1 Peter 15, 15 and 16, Be holy as I'm holy. He didn't say be holy because He, he didn't say, Try to do your best to be holy, but you're never going to get there. Is anybody hearing me today? In fact, anybody that says, anybody that's ashamed to say that you're holy or that you're righteous, oh, you can't say that either. None are righteous. No, not one. No, not in the beginning. But then he begins to change us and makes us righteous in him. Our righteousness is found in him, just like our holiness is found in him. I'm, I'm telling you, there's people in this room right now, people watching online, and you're, you're struggling because you're saying, well, I can't, I'm, there's no way, I'm not holy, I'm not righteous. Well, then it's a great day to repent. It's a great day to meet Christ. Come to Him. Holiness isn't marked by your perfection, it's marked by your position in Him. Righteousness isn't marked by perfection and the keeping of laws. It's marked by your presence in Him. We've been trained for centuries to judge everything by a book, by a, a rule, by a list. We've been trained. At some point, somebody has to begin to change that. Why not us? Why not now? That's what the whole, the rising of sons, this series is all about. Sons, rise up. Know who you are. Know that your relationship with Him is not because you're perfect in every way, but you are positioned correctly. Holiness. Holiness is what you find at the conclusion of the law. At the death of law. You'll never find holiness in law because there's no holiness in the law. In fact, the law is a very... Oh, what's the word? Is the antithesis of holiness. It's completely contrary to holiness. If I'm keeping the law, this is all flesh. But when I come to Him by faith, holiness is in Christ. And if I come to Him in faith, holiness is in me. Holiness is what you find at the end of the law, but it's only found, and it's only found in faith. Only found in faith. Let me wrap it up. I don't know how long I've gone now, about 10 minutes probably. But law illuminates. Everybody say law. law. Illuminates sin. Boy, this is going to be tough for some to take, but let me just say it the best I know how. Sin consciousness, I, I taught this years ago, but sin consciousness robs you of your ability to walk freely in Him. Yeah. Thinking through how I want to state this. 
Um, Let me ask you this. Let me do it this way. Do you think for a second, do you think for even one second that Jesus Christ is worried about all the sins you're going to commit? Do you think he spends any time at all considering the sins you might commit today? No, think about it. Do you think God, do you think Yahweh at all spends any time talking to Holy Spirit, talking to the Son? Let's think about what these guys are going to do today and let's figure out how much forgiveness we're going to have to get up. Do <laughs> you think he considers at all how many sins you're going to commit? Not at all. You know what he considers? You know what the Father's always considering? How deeply you're going to believe in him. Man, they're waking up. Sam's waking up. Holy Ghost, Sam's waking up this morning. I'm so excited. Norris is waking up. I'm so excited. How are they going to demonstrate faith in us today? I can't wait to see all the ways that they demonstrate that they believe us, trust us. Their hope is in us. Their confidence is in us. Their success is in us. I can't wait to see how they demonstrate that. Not one time did they ever say, oh, they're about to wake up. How many ways are they going to fail? Oh, Norris is waking up. Norris is waking up. Oh, Holy Spirit. Are you ready? I got a feeling today's a doozy. There's a lot of need for you today. You better go get Jesus. Because this is about to get really bad. Hmm. You think that's ever happened? Never. Because all the Father sees in you is a possibility. possibility he never looks at you and sees you in whatever condition you're in and says they're hopeless never but when he sees you stirring in your bed in the morning driving on your way to the office in the morning coming home in the afternoon sitting down at dinner with your wife and your husband or your kids And when he sees you gathering together, all he ever sees is, how are these sons demonstrating today? Oh, I love my sons and daughters. Oh, look at them. And they come to me. Their faith is in me. But see, because law illuminates sin, It's very difficult for anyone to ever have the kind of relationship with Jesus Christ that he really wants to have with them, one that's free. One that has peace. Too many believers today, even under the sound of my voice, whether in this room or on the other other side of that lens, too many believers today have no peace in the relationship with him because all they think about is the laws that have been broken and that law illuminates sin. I broke this law, I'm a sinner. I broke that law, I'm a sinner. I broke that law, I'm a sinner. What about... I have faith in Him. I'm a son. Sonship does this, just like it did in my family. When my kids were growing up, did they break laws? Yeah, they did. Do you think we ever sit around the table? When we gather together at Thanksgiving, do you think we're going to sit around the table and rehearse the laws that they've broken? You're awful, son. You're awful, Kaylee. You're awful, Alex. I mean, I can't even believe all the things you did. It's it's amazing I even love you today. (laughs) You think that's going to happen? I can't even believe it. Wait, before I can even cut the turkey with you, I've got to get this stuff out of my mind because I'm so backfilled with all the crud that you created in my life and, and all the challenges and heartaches that you caused me. Do you think that would ever happen? Were there ever laws broken, rules broken, moments of heartache? Oh, you better believe there were. But do you think I focus on those for a second? No, you know what we're going to do? We're going to talk about all the ways they're a blessing to me, all the ways they've trusted me, all the ways they've loved me, all the ways they've honored me. That's what the the focus will be on. 
Why? Because they're sons and daughters. I'm not going to say to them, you did it again. You're no longer a Parker. Well, two of them aren't anymore. (laughs) Because they broke too many rules. I'm extracting the Parker blood from you. No. No. Faith is believing that Christ is for you no matter what your past or your present looks like. Faith is believing that under every circumstance, Christ is for you. Doesn't matter what your past looked like or your present. When I say past, I'm not talking about a year ago. I'm talking about five minutes ago. Five seconds ago. Any time before now. I'm telling you, Christ is for you. Christ is for you when you've doubted. Now listen to me. Christ is for you when you doubted. He was for you when you didn't think you believed. He was for you when you weren't sure. He was for you when you broke the laws. He was for you when you couldn't keep any of the laws. He was for you when sin filled every line on the piece of paper and you didn't find righteousness anywhere. He was for you. Faith destroys the works of the law. Faith destroys the need to keep the law. Faith in Him. But if you've, faith is misplaced and the faith is in the law, that very law will become the curse that tells you every day you're unworthy. You're never going to make it. Stop trying. I would say this to you, that feel like in your world and in your heart, that somehow you feel overwhelmed, you feel like you've come to the end, you feel like I can't do this anymore because I I can never live up to what's expected of me to be a believer. I would say to you, you're at a great place. When you come to that place, don't regret the moment you get there. Celebrate it. Because it's at that place that you realize, I can't do this by keeping all the rules. I've come to the place now where all I can do is have faith in Him. And because of my faith in Him, if there's a work needed, He will do the work. The beauty of Holy Spirit, another subject too, but the beauty of Holy Spirit is this, that when we come to Christ and we come to Him in faith, There's this part of God called the Holy Spirit that makes us, begins immediately to make us aware of what honors the Father and what doesn't. He immediately begins to convict us and cause us to become aware of those things that are for Him and that are against Him. But He doesn't do it in such a way that it's like getting hit over the head with a sledgehammer. Holy Spirit's gentle. And when you have an ear to hear and an eye to see, Holy Spirit will come to you and He will nudge you this way and He will nudge you that way. Now you get to make a choice. My faith is in Christ, not in the laws. But I'm being moved by His Spirit to change this or to change that. And when you do it like that, man, you live freely. You go to sleep at night in peace. No guilt, no shame. So here's the deal. So when I say it's time for sons to rise up, the only way we can do that is when in our mind, in our head, in our in our thoughts, in our process, in our spirit, in our heart, we begin to recognize, we begin to realize, Lord have mercy, have I been trying so hard for something that was given to me so easily? (laughs) Have I been working so hard, or not easily, freely? Have I been working so hard to try to achieve something that so freely was handed to me? If it's true that Christ went to the cross, cross for all of us, even before we were born, 
Do you think for a second that he would have gone to the cross for people who weren't even born yet if he were only going to do it for those who were perfect? Here's the news. Nobody in this room is perfect. Nobody in this room is perfect. But those who have faith in Christ are being perfected. Meaning, when you see that word in Scripture, those of you that have been here for a while, you know, when you see that word perfect in Scripture, the, the interpretation of that word is being matured. We're being matured in Him. We're growing up in Him. So guess what? When we're growing up, things happen. So when things happen and it's not you, or if it is you, if it is you, stop living in shame. Just say, you know what? I, I love that I serve Christ and I'm going to let Him work on me. Amen. And when it's somebody else, don't go to them and say, I can't even believe they're raising their hand. Their arms should be so heavy this morning they can't even lift them out of their, get them out of their pocket. No. I don't see the sin in them. I see the faith. See. Faith. See faith. See faith in that one across the room. See faith in that one sitting in front of you. See faith in your husband. See faith in your wife. See faith in your children. See faith so that God has something to work with because it is not through the law that He works, but it is through faith that the miraculous happens. Stand with me if you would please this morning. You know, I don't know, again, people in this room... Sometimes we, we get, when we gather like this, you know, it's uh, someone who is new in the kingdom of God or, or just coming in or maybe they're not in the kingdom of God at all and they're, they're sitting there and they hear or they're watching and they hear and they see and, and there's this sense of uh, inside of you, man, I just want to get it right today. Man, I feel like today is the day I, I just need to get it right. I don't even know how to define getting it right. But I can tell you to, getting it right today is simply saying, Father, I accept you. I want to come to the end of the law. I come to the end of the law today because all the laws I've been trying to keep haven't been working, but I'm, I'm coming to the beginning of faith today. And I receive you. And if I'm talking to you this morning, I don't know who you are, but if I'm talking to you this morning, would you get out of your seat and come join me at the front? I want to lay hands on you. I want to pray with you this morning.